uh, new session on the nexus and productive use approaches to scale investments in uh, decentralized renewable energy. So I'm Iris Nicomadi. I work at ADEM, the French Agency for the Ecological Transition, and I have the pleasure of moderating this session with this amazing panel. Uh, so on my right, uh, Adam Armion, Senior Program um, Advisor at Energy for Impact, Tobo Banda, Innovation Lab Lead at Cross Boundary, uh, Olivier Jacquet, a VP Access to Energy Business Development at Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric, uh, Ar Ahmed Bedchi, <laughs> co-founder and CEO of Water Kiosk, uh, Manuel Wilhaus, sales engineer at Faisan, uh, and Arnaud Henin, I hope I <laughs> pronounced it correctly, a managing director at Gomier Power Networks. So Paul Muya could not join us, unfortunately. Um, so before starting, um, sorry, yes. I don't know, can we have the presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, I will just do a really brief introduction to the topic of this session. Um, and before doing that, I'm gonna take two seconds just to present uh, Adem, um, the organization I work for. So we, as I said before, Adem is the French Agency for the Ecological Transition. Uh, we are uh, this, a state uh, operator under the supervision of the Ministry of the Ecological Transition and the Ministry uh, for Research and Higher Education in France. Um, so we work at all the sectors that are connected to the ecological transition, apart from biodiversity. Um, and our mission is to amplify the deployment of the ecological transition and improve uh, <laughs> um, our collective expertise uh, and prepare the future. Uh, so you might ask yourself, what is a French uh, agency doing here? We actually work at the international level as well. Um, at the European level, uh, first of all, and also um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, um, where we support and finance uh, international projects. Um, we implement a lot of capacity building activities with our counterparts and with so many partners. Um, and uh, yeah, we are part of a lot of networks. Uh, we are partners of IRE um, for a long time. So. That's why we're here. Um, and actually, so we've been working in the field of sustainable energy access for more than 30 years. Um, we launched a new dynamics uh, in 2017 with the launch of two call for projects for a really small size uh, of grid access, energy access projects. Um, so we actually financing um, 19 innovative projects in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we launched also a national working group uh, on access to energy, and I see a lot of members here today, so I'm really glad to see them here. Um, and I mean, in these last um, years, we saw that innovative solutions do exist, and we've seen that this morning as well, but there are some barriers that uh, are still there. Mm, mainly financially uh, speaking and also regument from the regulative point of view, sorry. Um, but today we're going to focus on the productive uses of energy. Um, so, as I said, we've been working in this field for a long time. So I just wanted to introduce the session by um, coming back to some main takeaways that we observed um, in these last years. Um, well, the first takeaway that we saw is that energy access does not necessarily mean energy use. Um, a lot of times when we uh, finance some energy access projects, we saw that the energy, I mean, that the local population were not, didn't really use the services. So there is a huge need um, to do some awareness raising on the use of energy. And of course, if we want to foster um, a local de uh, development, then of course, we need to go uh, further than just uh, domestic uh, electricity access. So really stimulate the demand to implement productive uses of energy. Um, so we've been working a lot on tools to really work with businesses to empower them to use, um, to have new ways of 
um, implementing these, uh, these businesses uh, based on our energy access. Uh, so for instance, there is a French NGO that developed a, a guide, uh, which uh, is called Pamela, that helps uh, local entrepreneurs to really put into place uh, a business. So how to do it in a really entrepreneurship point of view uh, and how to really answer to the needs, to the local needs and aggregate uh, services so that it really answers to, to, um, to the local reality. Um, and another huge point that we're going to see today, um, thanks to the panel, uh, is also finding the right equipment, actually, so that we really um, that we provide the energy that is needed. Um, and another big, um, we are also working a lot, and especially with the French Agency for Development, on the digital component. Um, because the, the digital tools really opened a lot of new solutions uh, for operation and maintenance, especially. Um, and it's really interesting to see how local entrepreneurs can really build up on these tools to handle their businesses. Um, so before launching the discussion, I just wanted to, pro to, to present to you, sorry, a, a project that we are implementing with ARE. Um, that aims at accelerating rural electrification in three countries, in Benin, Cameroon, and Madagascar. So based on all these takeaways, uh, this project um, aims at uh, doing a market, market study on the decentralized renewable energy equipment for productive uses, um, um, developing also a technical guide that will be in French and in English, um, for rural healthcare facilities electrification. So this guide will contain uh, technical norms, um, uh, templates for operation and maintenance uh, contracts, uh, PPA, etc. And finally, an awareness campaign on the decentralized renewable energy deployment for productive uses in rural communities um, so that we <laughs> take up on this um, um, but what we saw that we really need to do awareness campaign, awareness raising um, locally. Uh, so stay tuned to follow the implementation of, of this project. Um, and now I think I will give the floor to our speakers. So we will see a lot of examples of on how to stimulate productive uses of energy, and then we will have um, a question and answer uh, period with the audience. So be ready to ask all your questions. Um, I will give the floor to Ada, first of all. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you, Iris. Um, yes, we are here to talk about productive use of energy in agriculture in Sub Saharan Africa the impact on livelihoods and on food security. So energy for impact has been working in, in this space for a long, long time. And now we are trying to innovate and bring something new to the market. Um, so we looked around and started really understanding, okay, Sub-Saharan Africa is faced with a massive challenge when it comes to food. By 2050, the continent needs to increase its food production by over 110%. At the same time, today, one third of the food that is produced on the continent is wasted across the supply chain, either because of processing and manufacturing inefficiencies or because of the absence of coal storage, coal chain and transport. For example, in Nigeria alone, Coal storage accounts for 45% of post-harvest oils. On top of this waste, there is a very low level of productivity. One of the key factors is absence to access to irrigation. So that not only affects productivity, but also resilience to climate events and changes in rain patterns. In Rwanda, we implemented a project for three years um, and we saw an increase to, to increase irrigation, solar irrigation access for smallholder farmers that triggered up to 30% increase in yields. And then there is a problem of value creation and value addition from the agricultural sector across Africa. Only $40 per ton 
uh, of a value added is recorded across Africa when it's five times more in Europe. So without access to energy and to electricity, agri SMEs and farmers cannot process, they cannot package, they cannot store, they cannot transport, so they cannot sell. Um, we are an energy company, an energy NGO, focusing on supporting businesses, but we are really forced to th start thinking, okay, this is not about energy. It is about agri, it's about productivity, it's about value add and livelihoods. Energy is just a mean to get there. So by bringing our energy expertise, we started thinking, okay, we need to put numbers on it. If we want investors to look into it, they'll always ask, what is the volume of the market? How much overall money is needed? Here we go. In the next 10 years, for investors to meet these needs of the agri sector, we'll need to invest $1.2 trillion into productive use of energy for agri. 70%, 75% of it will go to agricultural value chains. And the biggest opportunities are in water pumping, dryers, freezers, milling, oil presses. Those represent over 80% of the investment needs um, to make Africa able to meet its challenges of food security. <clears throat> so we've had the chance to have a very flexible and, and open-minded donor, Vital Foundation, that told us, okay, guys, this is a very big, hairy question. Go and inquire, interview as many local um, businesses, banks, investors, agri-processors as you can, and understand what could be a solution that would move the needle. Because <clears throat> a lot of us, NGOs, donors, investors, are tapping ourselves in the shoulder, thinking we're doing great things. We are putting PUE on the top of the agenda. We are doing this de-risking program, this innovative um, mechanism. But really, it's all very scattered. It's all very crowded, but it's all very scattered. So we started thinking, okay, what can we do to add value to what is already there that is not really changing the tide? Um, and those four key challenges came up. The first one, it's a crowded space, both on the agri side and on the energy access side. There are lots of businesses, lots of business models, a lot of opportunities, lots of subsidies, lots of things. How do you navigate? You're a farmer, you're an agro processor in the dairy value chain in Tanzania. How do you navigate all that? How do you know what's the best fit for my need as a processor? Where do I get the money? Is this technology coming from China? How do I get it into Tanzania? How much is it gonna cost me to go through custom? Are they certified? Can I get or, uh, repair our spare parts in the country? All of these questions, where do you find answers? Then you have a lack of integrated transport and storage services in the last mile and in the first mile, which make productivity investment very expensive and very high risk. And finally, local lenders have low trust in the business case, the rentability and the quality of most PUE investments. So we thought, okay, if we design yet another program, is it really gonna help? What are the key USP that something that we could put together would need to have? First, it must facilitate PUE investment decisions for agri-processor and off-takers um, and for local lenders. Local currency lending is absolutely fundamental to unlock. Second, it must create economies of scale, traceability and transparency in the sector. Third, it must aggregate critical services for sellers and buyers of PUE services. It's too scattered and too small scale. We must create scale and aggregation. Third, a fourth, it must de-risk PUE business case for local lenders. And finally, it must empower businesses to maximize the impact of their PUE investment so that they are making money out of it and get, can get route to market for their produce. 
So we have designed and we are convening um, a B2B marketplace like the Jumia of PV for agri-processing across Africa. It will be a digital e-commerce platform offering end-to-end -end PV services like bulk procurement, shipping, custom clearance, storage, insurance for goods in transit, repair, replacement, upcycle packages to all the agri actors and SMEs that want to invest in their productivity, in their value creation, and in their resilience. It will, at the back of it, build credit profiles and track the credit profiles of the companies selling and buying on the platform. And because we are an NGO, our mission is not to, to, to do the next unicorn. We will create this facility with private sector partners, businesses that will sell and buy the produce. But what we want to get out of it is to be able to set up a common good vehicle that does a lot of data generation and insight generation to donors, to people that want to invest in rural resilience and livelihood enhancement to understand the impact of PV on rural economies at scale. So please join us. Please come and talk to us. It's the beginning. We are setting up a group of eight key partners to launch this uh, B2B platform, um, digital marketplace. And of course, we want to design it such that it serves the business that are going to sell their products on it, be them energy services or product, productive use appliances. We want to design it such that the buyers of the services in the agri space are finding it fit and so that local lender gets more comfort in investing this 1.2 trillion backed by international investors to capitalize them into productive use for agri-value chains. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And I'm sure a lot of people from the audience will be interested <laughs> in partaking into this process. So yeah, Tombo, it's up to you. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's working. Great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tombo Bandam from Cross Boundaries Innovation Lab. Um, so just to introduce Cross Boundary briefly. So we unlock um, the power of capital to make strong returns in emerging and frontier markets. We do this primarily through two avenues. We have an investment platform, investment platforms actually, and an advisory arm. So I am from the Innovation Lab, which is under the cross-boundary advisory arm. So to, to share a bit about what we do um, at the Innovation Lab. So we work with uh, mini grid developers. We work with utilities um, to, to build the, the grid of the future. Um, and what is the grid of the future? So we really believe it's, you know, this interwoven mesh of generation distribution, storage, occurring across many different nodes with many different stakeholders involved. So the private sector, utilities, government stakeholders, consumers, all participating in this grid of the future. And we work with uh, mini grid developers and utilities to, to really answer three questions. So one is how can we reduce costs um, to, to build the infrastructure? Uh, two is how can we increase revenues? Um, and three is how do we build a smarter, more integrated grid? So what has that got to do with uh, productive use and the nexus of agriculture and energy? So one thing we see across both mini grids and utilities is that uh, the majority of consumption comes from a small subset of the users, which everyone in this room will know. Um, but what that means is that concentrating on that small subset of users can really have an outsized impact on your revenues and the economic viability of whatever it is you are installing. So what we see, especially on the mini grid side, so, so the data on screen now is from um, 13,000 connections um, that we have tracked. Um, and, you know, the, the top... 20% of customers are responsible for almost 80% um, of the consumption. So 
these 20% of, of consumers and connections are businesses. Um, and supplying income generating machinery or productive use machinery to this top 20% really has an outsized impact on the business model. Oh, oh, great. So specifically what businesses? So Ada touched upon it. Um, milling is a huge uh, business opportunity actually. So 10% of your 1.2 trillion is, is in milling. Um, and what we know is that in mini grids, um, grain millers use eight times more energy than the medium user. Um, and they're not even running their mills at full capacity. So increasing utilization, increasing uptake um, of electric mills could have a significant effect on the consumption of mini grids and utilities. So what are we doing about it? So what we see, especially on the mini grid side is that you know, most communities already have um, millers present on site that have their diesel milling machine they're not really willing to switch to electric. They've already made their investment. So, you know, why should they? So we are working um, with some developers in Kenya and Nigeria to do some diesel to electric conversion of um, grain mills um, to understand what the economics um, is on the mini grids and understand what it is on the grid load. Um, understand uh, what it means in terms of profitability and also understand the technical performance of you know, installing an electric motor onto these um, diesel um, powered motors um, and what effect that has you know, on the, the mini grid uh, load as well. Um, so we know that there's some additional challenges to be addressed um, when it comes to these conversions. Uh, number one is the tariff. So you know, what tariff makes sense um, for grain millers who are using diesel before to now switch to electric and charge the customers the same rate and still make a profit. Um, and also, you know, auxiliary services such as soft starters. So when you're putting in, um, you know, high rated motors that will generate a big inrush current, um, they require soft starters so that the, the mini grid um, doesn't have technical issues with it. So the cost of these soft starters also has to be addressed and built into the business model you, you think about when you think through conversion of electric mills or of diesel engines into electric mills. So that's what we're doing um, at uh, the Innovation Lab. Um, we would, yeah, we would love to talk to any of you who are interested in this. I'm, I'm glad we have Schneider here, Ada, understand, you know, how can we bring in motors, soft starters, reduce the cost and, you know, take advantage of this uh, $120 billion opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Zombo. And thank you for respecting the time. <laughs> Olivier, it's up to you. Thank you very much. So my name is Olivier Jacquet. I'm heading a business development for access to energy at Schneider Electric, belonging to the sustainable development uh, department. Okay. So just a little bit of history before I uh, use uh, most efficiently my seven minutes. Um, we are not a newcomer in the access to energy space. Uh, in fact, uh, Schneider Electric, if I look at the productive use, we've installed in the world more than 1,000 mini grids, solar mini grids uh, throughout the world in the past 10 years, roughly half of it in Africa, 500 plus. And before we got there, in fact, our journey uh, towards uh, bringing access to energy solution to the market started in the year 2001. That's more than 20 years ago. And at that time, uh, our CEO, this is coming directly from the CEO of Schneider Electric, Jean-Pascal Tricoeur, we believe access to energy is a, is a basic human right. And we're scratching our heads saying, okay, let's start it. Uh, let's start this approach with... Uh, a philanthropic approach. So through the Schneider Electric Foundation that was created in 2001, we started doing projects to help electrify communities in um, different emerging countries. And after 10 years operating this model, we realized that we were not even a drop in the ocean. We had helped 
tens of thousands of people get access to electricity, electrifying schools, hospitals. And we realized that compared to at that time, I'm talking 2009, that there were 1.3 to 1.4 billion people not having access to electricity. And we said to ourselves, if you continue like this, it's going to take a few centuries before we can even have a significant impact. We were inspired by uh, another company called Danone, food and beverage, so totally different field. But we, we were looking at what they did in Bangladesh at that time. In fact, they realized that in Bangladesh, there was a lack of uh, products for uh, feeding the children with milk. So they decided to create a social business where they would sell yogurts, having milk in, in it, of course, uh, at, at production cost to the market. And they managed to develop a business of a few million uh, euros that could help solve the issue. So we said to ourselves, let's be inspired from this. That was back in 2009, 12 years ago. Let's make a business out of it because there's no limit to the size that the business can reach. So we started this approach uh, by developing our own product range, starting, so we don't gone through all the story of it, starting with solar lanterns, developing towards SHS, and then now more and more focused towards productive use realizing that just a point of light uh, would certainly not change drastically the life of the people living in rural areas. We want them to have access to more productive use type of products, okay? So I'm just making a little bit of history to explain where we come from. Um, and in fact, from that time, if you look at our three pillars that uh, Carol presented during the introduction this morning, we have inherited from the good old times of the foundation two main pillars of our access to energy program. The first one on the left is training young electricians in rural areas, creating vocations, helping people to, to be skilled and be able to install and make business out of this. Hello? Yeah, it's all, it worked to foster job creation uh, throughout Africa, Africa mainly. The other one on the far right is investment funds. So we have today three investment funds aiming at supporting startups who are making a difference technologically wise in this space. So we've won uh, one fund for Asia recently created, one for Africa in Nairobi called EAB and one in Paris in France. And in the middle, this is what we started in 2009 create a business, which is called social business, not having a vocation to make profit, uh, but having a vocation to make impact. So I myself challenge, my main KPI is how many people I help get access to electricity each year. So last, last year for my perimeter, Africa, Middle East, South America, we did 2.2 million. Now I have to do this year 2.5. So that's my challenge. And I'm looking for partners to be able to achieve this, of course. Um, just in numbers, I will go quickly through this one. It was mentioned by Carol this morning. So on the three pillars, uh, since 2009, we've helped 34 million people get access to electricity. We want to reach 100 million by 2030. Uh, on training, so we've trained 300,000 electricians throughout the world. We want to reach 1, um, 1 million by 2025. And... Uh, for the impact investment fund, we want to invest in 25 companies starting from 20, knowing that we do also some exits. So after all these years of work, I would like to share with you the different products and solutions that are available to the market everywhere. We try to help this access to energy journey, and it's really our mission to, to try to impact as much as we can. I will not talk too much of the products on the left part of this slide because these are products which are basically DC appliances, solar lanterns on one side with our famous Mobilia, the first product we issued in our uh, program. Then uh, right in the, on the right, there is the solar home system, solar hybrid systems. And recently, which we are launching today uh, in Dar es Salaam, the new inverter, for uh, backup. So basically we are addressing here 
off-grid systems and on-bad grid system or unreliable grid. And then we have what we call the Vilaya, which is uh, solutions helping uh, basically mini-grid. And with this, we have three models. One which consists of selling products to local players who have the capability to uh, put this in a, in a full-fledged plug-and-play solution. Second one, which is intermediary, we can sell a switch gear, so mini grid in a switch gear to a, a partner that would be able to do the cabling on the civil works. And then the last one is a fully plug and play solution. So I put here an example of such plug and play solution from Schneider. And the reason why I chose this one is because the factory manufacturing this is in uh, Kenya, not far from here. So we in Nairobi, uh, an assembly uh, line where we can do uh, such a plug and play. We believe it's important to have those three models because in countries where you find an ecosystem of solar system integrators, for example, local companies who really can master uh, the mini grid solutions. I'm over time. Yeah. Okay. I'll go fast. Uh, it's better to let uh, as much as the value to the local players as possible. And those type of plug and play, we sell it to countries where there's absolutely no skills, so they would like a plug and play. Uh, the journey is uh, not an easy one in Africa, because uh, I would like to refer to some numbers uh, that I can share with you. So the World Bank is following up a database of 4,000 solar microgrid projects installed in Africa. Out of those 4,000, 50% are not operating only four years after their uh, commission. Interesting. And it's improving because four years ago, it was 80% of those new grids which were not working four years after a commission. And with today a PhD student, we can talk about this in the Q&A, studying why this is happening and what can we do to solve this. And it's about ecosystem, it's about skills, it's about setups, business models, a lot of things and i'll be happy to share uh, our experience on this later on thank you thank you very much Hamid. good uh so good afternoon to you i would just jump quickly should i present the rest of your presentation here? <laughs> so <laughs> i'm just pressing uh any question please let me so my time probably starts from now good so <laughs> good afternoon to everybody i'm covering the other aspect of uh, productive use of renewables from the work we started in East Africa and then later in four years time from the time we started is now global but we come to it quickly. So uh, the African entity of us is called Water Kiosk or Boost is right there and I just could see that one of our machines just passed from your bag and arrived to the booth so you can feel free going to the booth after this session. We focus on this green canister and the bucket. And these figures, for those of you from Kenya, you may check these figures as well. Um, this type of raw water, which is polluted, mineral contamination, uh, bacteria, virus, you know, many, many things there. The raw water, let's call it, 1,000 liter of it is $10 in a market like Kenya, 20 shilling per 20 liter bottle. So uh, it's unreliable, it's unsafe. In Berlin, I'm paying like three euro per 1,000 liter of hygiene drinking water, compare it from my tap and then compare it to $10 for that quality of water. It's insane. The problem is not just drinking water. Look at this picture. This is the challenge that uh, the world is facing more and more. Having salt intrusion into boreholes that for generations they were supplying people, they were supplying farmers all around the world. Now we see more and more boreholes are turning saline from different parts of the world, and then it kills farming. It creates migration, forced migration, water refugees. We came with a solution in 2015, uh, solar water desalination system with three characteristics. First, being direct drive solar powered system, no battery, no buffer, no diesel, no grid, nothing. Just solar panel and the machine. Uh, that saves a lot of costing and logistics for uh, installation in the remote part of the world. Second, being simple. So being direct drive, being simple. And third, the rational outcome of these two being affordable. 
When we talk about affordability, producing 1,000 liter of hygiene drinking water, like the one that I have with me here, this quality of water from direct ocean water with this machine would not cost anything more than 50 cents. When it's direct seawater, when it's brackish, when it's larger machines, economy of scale, this figure goes to 20 cents. $20 cent for, for 1,000 liters of hygiene drinking water. And on the simplicity, to operate such a machine in the remotest part of the planet, the simplest plumber with a spanner and a screwdriver can do over 80% of the maintenance of the machine. We have proven records in many countries, and it's not just a slogan. It's a proven record that uh, it can be tracked easily. This is one of the layouts of our project in East Africa, is in Kenya, very close to uh, Tanzanian border as well. So you see the solar panels on top of a roof, on a rooftop of a school. You see the small, uh, I don't know if I have a pointer here. Uh, you may see one small room, which is a, which was a kiosk uh, and the machine is there. And then you see the, so this part we deliver drinking water. Then we are on productive use of renewables. Then you see the fish farms on the top right one, the three fish farms. The fish farms are receiving the wastewater of the machine. We are growing fish in the wastewater of the machine that otherwise should be dumped and we are using it. And then you see the three lines, they are the vertical farms. You see the nurseries, you see the sanitation center. It's not just drinking water, many different aspects of the machine, many different aspects of a challenge in a rural village is answered by renewable energy. This is our current presence. So we are manufacturing in Berlin. We are so proud to say that from October 15th last year, we started manufacturing in Nairobi. So it's not just a work that we deliver from Germany. We are also now manufacturing in Nairobi. So similar to yours that you are manufacturing there. That means in East Africa, the delivery time of us is two days. Two days, entire East Africa. Then the facility in Nairobi is covering from Somalia down to Madagascar. Next year, we are opening our assembly hall in Senegal to cover from Morocco down to Namibia. Uh, we are now in Latin America and also in East Asia, in Philippine and Indonesia. Uh, part of our simplicity is actually a complex remote monitoring and remote management. My office in Berlin can read the machines that are installed in remotest part of Africa in Berlin, not just reading it, ordering it, not just ordering it, whenever we have a better solution as a software, as a brain of the machine, we update the machine when the machines are in the deep deserts of Somaliland, Somalia, everywhere. We have our eyes there. And then there is a troubleshooting. Anything happen, simplest way tells the operator how to, does, how to do the troubleshooting. The operator sees this screen, we see it in Berlin, and we order and we help the troubleshooting of the operator. It's part of our simplicity. And the projects are creating carbon credit. We already sold carbon credits of 41 of our projects. The first, the, the second hundred batch is already confirmed. And for those of you in the finance of such industries, remember carbon credit and the sales of carbon credit can be part of the finance of such projects. We already have proven it. So uh, as I said, 41 system already sold their carbon credit. The second batch is 100 systems that is already listed in gold standard. This is our assembly hall in Nairobi, for those of you interested about having a very African work. So we see quality work delivering. Nairobi is receiving SKD units, delivering the machine in the front as finished product. This machine in the front line, you see the, this machine is now installed in Menazi Moja Hospital, the biggest hospital in Zanzibar. For those of you, again, on investment and what we can talk, this is our new projects. Tuba, Senegal, uh, those of you from West Africa, you know it. The project worth is 30 million euro, 100 of machines, 100 of, of 10,000 liter per hour machine would be installed in this city and delivering 10 million liter of water per day, 10 megawatt of solar array installed, it's not centralized, decentralized one and creating 110 jobs and 20,000 ton of CO2 creation per year, which is a big part of the finance mechanism of this project. This is our records globally. Uh, as you see, it's not just an idea, it's not just a pilot, it's already proven technology, and we are happy to have it in different part of Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Manuel, ça Dear of Greek community, and uh, th thank you, uh, Ines. <laughs> Dear of Greek community, and hello to those who are interested in the productive use of energy uh, by solar applications. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this op opportunity and welcome to self Chill. My name is Manuel Wilhaus, and I'm, uh, I want to give you an overview of how the productive use of energy can be uh, ha can help electrify rural areas. self Chill is a brand formed by Faizan <clears throat> and solar cooling engineering. Further, the University of Hohenheim and freelancers are work with us. Faizan is the supplier for the components. Solar cooling engineering does the engineering and uh, the University of Hohenheim is a scientific partner in this, uh, in this project. We're located in Southern Germany, but promote our ideas uh, all across the world by our local partners. We develop and project small and medium scale cooling systems. Those can be designed, assembled according to the local needs and availability of material. <clears throat> um, only a few core components need to be imported, but um, we can also deliver finalized systems. Beside the design, supply, and projecting, we train people in the target area to assemble and customize such systems to their own or to their customers' needs. The trainings are offered at our partners' locations, uh, for example, in Kenya, Zambia, and also Tanzania. But we also offer online trainings, online courses where the trainees learn how to assemble uh, such a cooling system using only a few uh, high-tech core components, but mainly components they can, which can be sourced locally. Um, the, in the next slide, I will give you a short idea of how cooling uh, can be uh, productive use of energy. Uh, the first example would be a farmer which cools uh, its product or entrepreneurs uh, can offer cooling as a service. This reduces post-harvest losses or opens new markets and frees small fo food producers from dependency relationships. Purchases can so be amortized within a few years. The modular cooling systems can further be integrated in mini grids as well uh, in existing ones as in new ones. And uh, so they can make those mini grids more efficient by using the surplus of energy. The device which makes this possible is uh, the water chiller. It's a basin filled with water. It works as a thermal energy storage to buffer the peaks of the demand and supply of energy. Core component of the water chiller is our self-chill cooling unit. It's a direct driven heat pump, which is specially designed for such application, in, especially in hot, air, uh, in hot ambient conditions. It's filled with a natural refrigerant. And if you are interested in this device, you can see it and visit us at booth 19. Um, in this slide, I, I, I'm going to show you um, which projects we already have uh, done in the, in the past years. Recently, we have installed two uh, cooling systems near Dar es Salaam. The first one is a cold storage room at a company which processes milk. They store and ripe cheese and other products inside. And the other one is a cooling system uh, at a small dairy farm. And only by cooling, they have access to a more distant market, market and can achieve fair prices for their milk. A third example would be a solar powered ice maker. Uh, the ice can then be used, uh, be sold to fishermen, or for example, other products like beverages can be, uh, can be cooled and then higher prices can be achieved. Um, I hope I have raised your interest in uh, solar powered cooling and uh, Appreciate, would appreciate a visit uh, um, to, of our booth, booth 19, um, 
or one of the displayed websites and uh, questions can be answered later in the question round. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manu. Um, Thanks, guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Arno Hennen of Gomir Power Networks. And uh, pleasure here to be here this afternoon to talk about our productive hub microgrids. Firstly, as, as Gomer Power Networks, we're really active in, in three main activities. Uh, we are mainly project developers, so getting microgrid project ready, uh, projects ready for investment and implementation. Uh, we also are an engineering and project management team, so we do all this in-house, uh, as well as we do asset management, which is really overseeing how projects actually run, uh, as well as, as overseeing operations of, of microgrid projects. Uh, two points on our, our business model. Firstly, our model, so we're mainly European based, but we work with local partners in our core markets, which are right now DRC, uh, Nigeria, and Mozambique. And I think the other aspect that's important is we've always focused on uh, economically viable projects. And so that's kind of driven our, our approach. We've worked on a lot of commercial industrial projects as well. And now bringing some of that to the more traditional mini grid space as well. Um, so some of, some of our insights on what we call kind of productive use microgrids. Um, for us, the, the base of, uh, of a system obviously is, is the energy. Most of what we work on is, is solar battery based systems with, with some diesel backup. Um, but that, that energy base allows a whole other layer of services to be provided. That includes water, sanitation, uh, telecom access, also security and logistics as well. And then that kind of bundle of services then allows other um, productive activities. So what we've also seen in other speakers mentioned in terms of agri-processing, fish processing, ice, uh, water, all water sales, this. And then again, beyond that, you can get to other service provision, that can be government, public services, health, other things. Um, so our model has evolved to actually typically include at least the first two la layers of, of that pyramid. So not just provide energy, but provide a whole other layer of services based on that energy, um, as well as, as sometimes integrating some of the, we call energy intensive activities. So that is cold storage, ice production, um, these types of activities as part of our operations. Um, a lot of things we've seen interestingly in our work as well. One, uh, a lot of the activities we want to, to see in uh, off-grid or, or rural communities don't exist there today. Uh, for example, let's go to the one in Vandak in a minute. Um, this is a large city which, because they haven't had power for, for or centralized utility power for six or seven years, a lot of the existing uh, industrial and commercial activity was abandoned. Uh, and so our, our focus is not just serving what is there today, but seeing what activities we believe should be uh, in such a community and then integrating that into our model uh, and bringing larger companies and corporate actors also with us into these communities to operate there. Um, the other critical activity, obviously these types of activities need to be commercially viable. And uh, for that to happen, there, there needs to be scale. There's often fairly high cost to access these communities to bring equipment there. And, and so a certain level of scale is really critical for, for the economic viability uh, of these types of projects. Um, and then I think as it's kind of mentioned in our model, uh, the businesses we're, we're working with, they need more than just a kilowatt hour. They often they need drinking water, they need sanitation, they need telecom and security. And so we bundle those, those uh, services together for these types of, uh, for our clients and these types of businesses. Um, Jumping to, to uh, the, the site we're building in, in uh, at DRC. So we're working at a, in a community called Bandaka, which is a city of about 1.2 million people uh, on the banks of the Congo River, about 700 kilometers upstream from Kinshasa. Uh, they have not had any utility centralized power for at least six or seven years. They used to have some diesel generators, and then I believe the fuel costs become, became too expensive. And so you have a very large community that is that is you know, very restricted in terms of energy and, and infrastructure. 
we are revitalizing a central area. So the part of our site is part of the main court of the city, um, which again, has very limited activity currently. Uh, and we have two phases under construction. The first one will be focused uh, on, on the site at the back. So that's around again, having the, the, the solar system installed and driving water treatment, uh, water purification, sanitation, the telecom and security access uh, with a initial clients being uh, a bank that will be coming back to the community, uh, ice production for, for drinks distributors and also for the fishing community there, uh, as well as a bakery, a, base, a bakery client that we're bringing to, to the, the city because again, they have, they've seen a, a market of over a million people with, with virtually no formalized, uh, formalized bakery production. So it's a very untapped market where they see a lot of potential. Um, and you know, some other aspects we're looking to expand into actually fish processing, uh, other logistics services on site in the second phase. Uh, and the other, the other advantage of the scale is scale allows us to have permanent operating team on site. Uh, so we're targeting about 35 to 40 people um, for the E Street itself. And we'll do all of it, everything from security, uh, basic uh, cleaning, uh, maintenance, operations of the whole site. Uh, and so that, that allows kind of faster response, higher reliability, as well as, of course, creating um, local, local employment and local activity as well. Uh, we're replicating various, uh, various aspects of this model, uh, firstly across the DRC, where uh, there, we're, we're seeing potential for at least 300 to 500 similar East Street sites uh, across, across the, the whole country. Um, there's many, many communities of, of hundreds of thousands that are currently underserved. So we're excited with that market. Um, in Nigeria, we're combining a hub approach with a more traditional mini grid. So having some residential connections as well. Uh, we're building the first, our first uh, Nigerian project in Ondo State right now with a further nine that are, that are developed and hopefully be implemented next year. And then in Mozambique, um, we're, we're working on smaller scale hubs in Mozambique and there will be uh, sort of slightly smaller, but uh, fish and ice. And so happy to discuss with anyone um, interested in these projects uh, all across other markets as well. Here are my contact details. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. We are perfectly on time. <laughs> um, so I don't know if there are questions from the audience. Now it's the time to ask them. Okay, we have... Um, uh, I'm Matthew Matimbe from Tanzania Renewable Energy Association. Uh, my question goes to all who are developing uh, micro grids. Uh, before you develop a micro grid, uh, there are no business being done there. So what strategy do you use to uh, create appetite for communities uh, to use uh, energy uh, for economic activities? Thank you. Don't be shy. <laughs> Ladies first. Okay, yeah. So I, I would probably recommend that uh, you do some survey. Uh, there are some uh, organizations who are very used to doing such surveys where they would visit each villages, each household, asking, you know, what use could you make of electricity? And then compiling all the assessments they could estimate, is it worse? Is there a business case behind? Is it worse to invest in a mini grid in your village? Um, and by experience, we see that once we implement the project, in fact, uh, the demand will grow very fast in the first month. And quite typically, six months to one year after the project is implemented, uh, we reach maximum capacity, so we need to, to have an extension. Um, 
but it's not always the case. In some cases, the assessments show a certain potential, and then in some cases, the mini grids are never used to the, their full potential. Uh, it may be to different reasons. For example, tariffs. Sometimes the tariff is too high. People don't cannot afford to buy. But definitely to make an assessment would be much safer before investing. Thank you. I don't know. Um, I have just one note. It's not mini grid, but the same things that you just heard on the mini grid can apply also for the water. Uh, one learning from our work from the first systems we installed into the later ones was uh, we were neglecting the importance of social uh, relationship between people when it came to water or even mini grid. I remember it was in uh, Somaliland, uh, Somaliland installation. We hired, we trained a person, like a very good one. We actually we interviewed several, hired one. And then when the project was about to run, people said he's from another tribe. They are the first ones who could not get water from it. So, we were just, we, we were not noticing some social relationships or the tribal things as well. So for any type of projects coming as a mini grid or mini, mini water or anything, the social relationship, the social uh, structure uh, in all work is now extremely important. Us, before going into any energy and water solution, now we have an intensive round of social understanding of relationships in that community. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> Someone said yes, but yes. I didn't. Okay. My name is uh, Victor F. Koliwana. I'm from Liberia, representing uh, Echo Power Liberia. We are at the front line of promoting solar. And I want to thank you for carrying solar energy to these directions. We believe that uh, the productive use of solar is very good. It's going to improve the economy. And what we're doing in Liberia, normally we demonstrate because most people have not seen solar really working. So they don't have, they believe they don't have the trust. So is there any way that we can pilot some of these uh, productive uh, use of solar in Liberia, because as they come and see it, then of course, most people would invest because solar from the beginning is very expensive. Is there any way that we can develop power projects to showcase this technology? That's my question. Well, who wants to answer? How to develop trust and showcase <laughs> that it can work? Yes, so maybe just to bring my uh, piece of answer uh, and also responding to the first question that was raised, that you are also to make sure you have uh, some subsidies from the authorities. Uh, to my knowledge, I may be wrong, but on the projects that I know, uh, I haven't seen a single project that is viable without subsidies. You need a subsidy in this business. Okay? Yeah, you cannot. Uh, invest fully a microgrid, pay for the operating expenditure, the OPEX, and ask the people to pay a cheap price for the water and make profit. It doesn't work. So you need subsidy. And in your case, if you want to start in a given country, probably the first thing to do is to find a way to finance a prototype, a demonstrator, uh, through some uh, foundation, etc. Uh, and obviously, from there, you can raise awareness and uh, develop this at a, at a bigger scale. Someone else wants to add? No? Okay. I know it's like hesitating. Oh, no, maybe. <laughs> um, so, so, firstly, I think there's an interesting point there that obviously. Uh, People need to see to, to believe. I think there's probably still some skepticism in terms of how reliable solar is, and that might also be because of some of the failures of earlier projects and, and, and perhaps also lower quality um, solar home systems or whatnot that probably created skepticism in the sector. That's something that's 
uh, interesting to, to hear and probably something at the sector we should all be aware of and focusing on making sure that these projects are good and, and viable for the long term and operating for the long term or else uh, this is probably something that will grow. Uh, fi finance is a challenge, I think, for all projects, for all project developers. Uh, uh, there's there's a big capex requirement, and I think that's probably why we're all here today as well, is to try to you know, match uh, match projects with capital to, to make the sector grow in advance. Um, but I, I think we're we are at a stage where uh, these projects can be economically viable. Definitely, the CNI sector on a pure CNI space is economically viable, and I think that will continue to lower scale. Um, so, so I think that's why for us aggregating projects to bring that viability. Um, I was in Liberia a year and a half ago or so, and, and um, definitely I, I think there is viable uh, viability for solar. The, the challenge is also just financing rates. As much as getting subsidies, financing rates are are a challenge if, if you have to pay 15, 20% plus financing rates um, on a 20 year asset, it, it makes it more challenging to be economically viable as well. Thank you. And since you're holding the mic, <laughs> I'm going to ask you another question that is related to the first one. Because during your presentation, you said that you also identify other activities in the place where you're implementing your projects that should that could potentially um, function. How how do you do that? And that you said that you bring uh, relevant stakeholders together to stimulate this demand. But concretely, how do you do it? <laughs> well, so, so I think the the starting point is understanding that. Of the community dynamics, what's actually present in the community. If we use the, the Bandaka example, um, so, so we have team members based out of, out of Bandaka. Uh, there were a lot of other activities that were there when there was grid. Um, for example, the bakery. Uh, there were bakeries in the past. Uh, when the grid stopped, those, those uh, also stopped being active. Um, and we're actually bringing bakery partners from Abidjan uh, who are in a very competitive environment. Apparently, there's bakeries on every street corner in Abidjan, uh, and they they focus on, on serving low income people in Abidjan, and, and it's a very interesting business. And when they came to Bandaka, they were blown away that there was just no no formalized bakery, and you have a million people. Of course, they're they're very modest, very low low income, but on aggregate, they're still feeding themselves and, and eating. And ironically, people in a place like Bandaka usually pay more. For the goods and services that they that they obtain than they do in Kinshasa, so there's like bank managers in Bandaka would have to fly birthday cakes for their kids from Kinshasa because there's no cold storage. Uh, so whatever they do get is extremely extremely expensive. So there's a whole market for uh, for for serving this as well. Um, Bandaka is known for its fish. It's at the confluence of of two major rivers of the Ruki with with the Congo River. Um, it's, it's renowned in the DRC for its fish, and yet uh, there's no cold chain to export to Kinshasa, which is a 15 million person market uh, with huge protein and food needs, and, and they import a lot of uh, imported goods, uh, including fish. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's all this type of, of potential. So in the second phase, we're looking at fish processing, developing that uh, flake ice as well. We have logistics partners to to bring that into to Kinshasa. Um, so yeah, it's I think working with certain types of clients, understanding the the opportunities and the communities, um, and targeting typically what will hopefully be high value activities to generate jobs and, and income in the community. Thank you. Are there other uh, questions? Yes. Uh, I'm living in Smanyanga. I'm coming from Akute Projects, an NGO based in Arusha. And um, from the experience that I have and the pilot project that I've done for the productive use of energy in the Doma, Iringa, and Morogoro, I've come to learn that, um, first of all, the supply and the end users, they are facing different challenges. One is the financial inclusion, that there is no financial institutions at the rural area which are active to support such kind of business solution. The second is 
the availability of energy efficient technology in the market. They are not easily be available in the shops. Despite of the success story that you may create into a pilot project, but when you want to scale it, they are not easily available. And the third one is that um, the issue of the ownership of the business case. Should it be owned by the energy entrepreneur who is supplying the technology, or should it be owned by end user who is using the technology for productive use? So I'm still, I've run this project for two years only, but those are the issues that are left unanswered. So I rely on your experiences. Thank you. I don't know if we have another question related to this one. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. I'm called Mulumba. Closer. Okay, I'm called Mulumba Matthias Suna from Kampala, Uganda. Greetings from the Pearl of Africa. Um, I've listened to the presentations and uh, I'm really excited because I came to learn about some of these innovations and that's what my organization does. I work with different sets of institutions, the state and non-state institutions, but I'm pretty much interested in the smallholder farmer, the community level person and how we can support that person. Uh, my experience working across uh, Uganda with the farmers is that one, most of the issues have been talked about affordability of some of these uh, issues. But what has not been mentioned is that these farmers don't trust solar. They don't trust renewable energies. They think they're not durable. They think probably they cannot access the spare parts when they break down. And therefore, when you try to introduce it, they prefer the electricity because electricity each time maybe it breaks off, but somebody's coming to really support it. I don't want to uh, pose this question to any of you, but I'm interested in having a discussion on how we can build that confidence within the, uh, the people. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we will take another question from the lady in front, and then you will answer to all of them together. My, my name is Gonsal from Sigua, from Nelson Institute of Technology. Down here, we do have the weak link between academia and the industries. Can you share with us how your companies are able to probably engage academia or academic institutions? Thank you. Oh, please, not um, okay, so yeah, um, just, just a very brief one. Well, uh, Devin Nakpal from Irina. Uh, quick question, I think, on the panel, somebody's in the energy business, but they're also in the water business. Somebody's in the energy business, but they're also in the agri-industrial creation business. I'm curious to um, learn if you've had access to non-energy funding. So have you tried to reach out to agricultural funding or wash sector funding and whether they've been open to looking at energy as a means of meeting their own development goals and whether that's whether there are synergies there between energy act energy health funding to meet the overall funding requirements thank you so should we proceed from this yeah from here and then, yeah <laughs> um so i think uh to answer the first gentleman's question i resonated with that very strongly because um here at, at the lab we believe there's really three building blocks to getting, um, you know, high performing, um, energy efficient machinery to people at scale. So yeah, first starting with the energy efficient machinery itself, it's hard to access that. Um, secondly is the supply chains to get that machinery and the productive use equipment from the factory to where it's going to be used in the communities. And then the third piece is the affordable financing itself. So we need all three of these building blocks for, for this to scale. 
Um, and I think we don't have the answer yet, unfortunately. Um, but I think part of the answer is um, number one, making the right stakeholders aware of the opportunity. Um, so when we work with um, financiers to do um, uh, appliance financing, you know, one of the things they are not sure of is you know how to do the credit assessment in an affordable way to finance those end users and communities. So if you can work with developers and other community members to, to get that cost down, you know, that's a way of bringing in um, the financiers. Um, and then on the machinery side and the supply chain side, we think through how to work with local distributors who are distributing other equipment um, or other goods. So whether it's fertilizer, agricultural inputs, if they are already supplying those areas, you know, how can we get the right machinery, the right spare parts um, to those communities, leveraging those same distribution networks? Um, so I think at the moment, it's, it's a question of uh, trial and error, um, but bringing these three building blocks together is really um, the job of all of us on stage in the room today um, to, to yeah, bring the right stakeholders together and then um, see, see what lands and spits on the wall. So, yeah, I think that's my answer to the first one. Thank you. So I have an answer to the last question. What we've seen working more and more now is impact focused and impact aligned investors that don't look at a sector, but rather, and that's really what we want to push for, look at the interdependencies and the interconnection between sectors to tackle a, a hairy challenge. So food security, you must be talking with investors that know quite a, de a great deal about water, about agri, um, about supply chains, customer consumer goods, about energy, infrastructure, transformation, industry, agro-processing, like the whole lot. Um, and so we are seeing that there are more and more investors that are welcoming these kind of conversations that take them a bit outside of their comfort zone but have a much more direct route to their impact of their dollars invested. And then to the, one of the first questions, I think, um, on how do you stimulate or how do you understand the potential and then stimulate the uptake of, uh, of businesses in, in mini grids or in newly electrified villages or um, we stand alone solar even. What we do at EFI, which is working quite well, actually here in Tanzania, is we, we bring um, demonstration trucks full of productivity equipment, standalone or energy efficient ones that are connected to the grid when there is a grid, and uh, micro entrepreneurs that we're mentoring around in villages for them, for people to see how it works and to have conversations with the micro entrepreneurs that are using his appliances to pour a meal in a village or to irrigate their fields um, and um, to do oil pressing. Um, so that is proving to be very successful in raising awareness and in getting people the concrete sense of, okay, these, people, these persons are like me. If they are doing this, why couldn't I? Um, and we work in partnership with MFI to bring the financing along at that village scale or Vicoba or Saku, depending where we are. Um, but demonstration days, demonstration tracks uh, with real micro entrepreneurs sharing their experiences has pro proven to be very uh, successful. Thank you. Um, do you have other answers? Uh, to the last question, actually, I cannot add anything more than what the others have exactly the point. The impact investment is changing the whole picture of funding. I remember five years ago, it wasn't like this. And now it's much more active considering the impact. That's why in our work, we made a document out of any of our projects, an impact report. So we submit to those who work with us. Uh, I would like to, uh, to, from these questions, I would just put the two, so this is the last one, and uh, the point from the lady regarding the academia. Uh, we could see that uh, the quality of the operators of us, the quality of the team working with us, 
as much as we try to hire the best of the best uh, in all budgets uh, in East Africa, it wasn't really solving the problem. We would hire after two months we could see that we cannot continue. So because of the uh, different capacities or lack of capacity. In 2015, in 2000, sorry, 2021, we established Water Kiosk Academy. It's all linked with, with academic institutions and trainings in, in East Africa. So we started training our own operators and the local talents, those who pass this academy service, which is free of charge, is for social responsibility. It's based in Nairobi. Those who pass those young talents who pass this courses, which is on uh, water, energy, and management, these three courses, then we would hire them, those who pass the courses. The head of Water Kiosk Academy is in our booth, Julie, you can talk to her and uh, whatever you know, service regarding this relationship with academy, with universities, with the uh, different technical schools in East Africa, you can ask. This was the part that we could do. And since we created this academy, you can see a jump in the quality of our service. It's very, very easy. Thanks. Nothing to add? Okay. <laughs> You don't have to. <laughs> I think we, we answered to all the questions. And maybe we can um, conclude with, I'm just going to ask you one question. You answer with one word, because <laughs> we talked about a lot. We talked about digital tools, services aggregations, training, tariffs, sustainability, a lot of things. But if you, should, if you had to pick just one lever we should work on to really scale productive uses on the continent, what would it be? Just one should be fast. I mean, you you can take some some seconds to think about ladies first, so that they have the toughest job. No, but you. Yeah, we're used to that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I would say local local lending. Yeah, okay. getting the local uh, investors on board. No, that was mine. <laughs> no, I would agree. I think. Uh, Financing overall um, is the, the biggest barrier this way. For me, I have three training, training, and training. <laughs> I have the fourth training. <laughs> <laughs> I would add on training and local capacity. I agree with the training. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say uh, economic viability. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you for playing the game. And thank you to the audience for your attention. Um, David, the floor is yours. <laughs> Would you allow me just to say one thing? We have a visit on Friday morning to one of our facilities in Kibaha. Anybody interested in the finance trip, you can have your breakfast there. You can, you can see one of the solar water desalination systems, farms, fish farms, and everything there. And if you want to see the machine, the booth is there. Easy to can see for those who do not come to Kibar. And uh, thank you to you, Hamet, and also to uh, CMR Group uh, for organizing and stepping up for organizing this activity for our uh, participants. Uh, very briefly, I'm not going to start a new session. So once again, thank you to the panel. Um, and now we go into the coffee break. What I came to announce is, well, not only is there a coffee break, but at 4.15, we have the Get Invest matchmaking meetings that are starting. So you have, in case of any questions, uh, the help desk is just outside in front of the stairs. And then, um, so please be on time, of course, for the meetings or cancel them if you can't make it. And then as soon as that's over, from 6 o'clock onwards, you are more than welcome to join us on the top of the hotel on the eighth floor, where we will have our uh, surprise 15th birthday party uh, with uh, music and uh, food, drinks, everything basically will be there. So to get there, take the elevator, eighth floor, you don't need the room card. And then, uh, and then we see each other in the meetings and then especially on the rooftop. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.